okay. Um, well, we can go ahead and get started. So welcome to our seminar series with the Center for STEM Education. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Elizabeth Mulcairin. She serves as the Vice President of Education for Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium. She's also the 2023-2024 Retiring President for National Science Teaching Association. Dr. Mulcairin is responsible for establishing, promoting, and maintaining formal and informal educational programs, managing over 1,200 volunteers, managing long-distance learning programs, developing curriculum, facilitating professional learning for educators, and overseeing the formal education high school zoo academy, middle school zoo academy, zoo kindergarten, and preschool. Over the years, Elizabeth has become a catalyst and leader in STEM education. Dr. Mulcairin serves on several boards and advisory committees including National Science Teaching Association Board of Directors, Association of Zoos and Aquariums Safe African Penguin Coordinator, National Science Leaders Association Board, Nebraska Association for Teachers of Science Board, and participates in the Regional Metropolitan Science and Engineering Fair and Regional Science Olympiad. She shares her passion for science by encouraging and providing unique opportunities for kids to explore STEM careers. Elizabeth is strongly committed to science and conservation education and its future in today's society. So welcome, Dr. McCarran. <laughs> well, welcome. Oh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so that sounds like a lot of what was on my resume and it is because I am kind of a unique crazy who who really um is passionate about science education and conservation education so so it sounds like a lot but also when you were listening to that bio you noticed there was a lot of partnerships there was a lot of things listed and they were partnerships and working and and collaborating and and of course having a dynamic staff. So I I do have the privilege of having um, twenty full time employees and two hundred part time employees in my education department. So so that makes it sound a little bit not like she's superhero <laughs> running around in her whole life is is uh, filled with meetings. So but like I said, it really does tap on the importance of partnership. So today I would like to, the beginning is going to be very, um, very simple so you can understand the, the mindset and where I come from when I'm looking at different partnerships and collaborations. Um, and then I'll open it up because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions of like, how, how do you form these university partnerships? How do you form these school district partnerships being an informal science education organization? So um, making STEM connections between school and business um, and bringing real world applications to students. So basically um, what we have are some key ingredients to create successful STEM programs that I have found have worked extremely well. And I always have to refer to these and of course update some of the terminology on it, but it's really the key ingredients to incorporate STEM education into current practices. So looking at um, what the schools are teaching, looking at the curriculum that, that the state has, being engaged in that process, but constantly reminding them that STEM is happening everywhere and to incorporate into those practice practices um, by using those real world relevant, um, utilizing, you know, the 3D world phenomenon or 3D learning, but what's going on? I mean, the zoo, there is a ton of stuff that is happening that is STEM related and relevant to what's going on in the classroom. So why can't you bring the students in or why can't you share this out through distance learning so that the kids can see a career being developed, STEM career, they can see themselves in it. And then creating a STEM ecosystem within our community. Um, that has been instrumental too, is the zoo um, started a grassroots effort and it was called a Omaha STEM ecosystem. And there's many ecosystems 
around the country. Some are statewide, some are citywide, but that's where you're bringing in all your business partners and education together so that we can start comparing notes. We all have the same agenda. We all want to develop our youth. And of course, in my world, I want everybody to go into science and conservation, but we can look at our notes and how do you provide those opportunities. So one of the um, the definitions, and I know it's really old and outdated, but there's some key pieces that I always look at. Interdisciplinary approach to learning, rigorous and academic concepts, and um, real world lessons and students apply the STEM. So giving, working with your business partner, working with the, the businesses and telling them it's okay, give, give these kids the opportunity to solve your problem. And you can utilize it, not utilize it, but give them those challenges. And then making the connections between the school, community, work, and global enterprise. So in the world of conservation, um, we have so many opportunities, there's so much conservation going on globally that we could get the kids involved. So example is African Penguin Safe that you heard about. There was a challenge that went out um, for nest box and how do you engineer a nest box with for the penguins um, that are, is environmentally safe that's safe for the for the penguins so and it also is serving its purpose purpose of protecting and so that challenge went out to high school students now yes big corporation took the ideas but that challenge went out so it gave those kids an opportunity to try to help save those penguins. Um, so what is an ecosystem? Of course, I'm a zoo person, so I have to have the savanna on there. Um, an ecosystem is community interacting stakeholders. So looking at all of your stakeholders, um, when people hear about the zoo, they, they uh, feel like our zoo, they feel, okay, conservation, animals, let's go see the animals. So more of biology, but they don't see the chemistry, the physics that's going on. They don't even see the technology that's happening. So opening up those, those stakeholders to even see this. So a prime example I always use is Union Pacific Railroad is huge here in Omaha. And they have a train dispatch center. And if you go into that train dispatch center, you see all these computers with all these digital tracks. And to me, and I, my husband's a train dispatcher. So to me, it looks like he plays a video game every night when he goes to work. But if you're looking at it, it's bringing in weather conditions, it's bringing in the speed of the trains. So you have your basic physics that's in there. You have your math that's in there. And when I talk to him, I'm like, well, you're doing science, you're doing STEM. And no, 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 because they don't even, he doesn't even know he's doing this. So when you're forming a partnership, um, education to business, it's really have them talk about what do they do or go see what they do or show them your curriculum or your um, course outlines or standards and start making those connections. So sometimes it takes the educator to be the creative one to show, hey, Mr. Architect, you are doing um, angles, lines, geometry when you're building out um, your building. So they don't know that they're doing that because it's entrenched in their daily work. But when you start teasing it out, and that's when it helps. And I know I went off on a tangent here. So this really works in, if you look at STEM ecosystems and you look at STEM education, it's all about those connections, community um, between the schools and the community and the work on that piece of it. So what's wrong with this picture? I'm going really fast because I want to get to the good stuff with you. But um, if you look in communities and it sounds like, um, you know, um, just chatting with Allison a little bit, this is very common in your area too. But if you look, you usually have like these silos. And so you have your learners in the middle with their family. You have higher ed, you have community organizations, you have your formal education and out of school. Um, we It's big in our area after school, business community, and then STEM, STEM institutes. And we're all working in these little silos and we're not communicating and we're not broadening our, our assets or our experiences to really focus in on that learner. So it should look like this in the com communities um, where you have all these interactions that are happening. 
for those learners to give them um, to really grow them, develop them and give them what they need. So that's all partnerships. So if you look at the lines on here, you see crossing lines or this network and all these partnerships. So when it comes to um, sitting down, you know, with our, our state science um, director and looking at the new science standards, they might say, hey, Elizabeth, you know, what about astronomy? You know, and I, I'm like, well, you know, the stars are important, like, you know, the science, blah, blah, blah. But why don't you bring in this partner to who's more of an expert? And so really um, being um, mindful of what is your niche and what's not your niche and how the whole ecosystem plays out together. Um, so how do you become part of an ecosystem? And I'm using ecosystem um, terminology because like I said, we all play a part. We all have our own niche. We all work together. We have to work together in order for there to be a successful system in place. And that's where that connections between the school and business happens. So find your niche. <laughs> that's my big thing. And I'm just going to tell you there, I've had this question. What about the predators and the prey? Okay. No, in my world of ecosystem, we have our niches, but we don't prey on each other. We work together and we find food together. So, so don't ask that question. So there is no predators and there's no prey on this. Um, so, so um, as I was been talking so why create these STEM partnerships? Because we're building capacity for all of our educators. That's huge. Um, and not only is it huge um, for the classroom teacher, but it's huge for the whole university system and with the formal education system so that there's not that feeling of isolation. Like I, um, a classroom teacher has to learn about force of motion and you know they're in the classroom by themselves and I, you know everybody's very knowledgeable and stuff but why not bring the experts in and bring in uh maybe union pacific railroad to talk about force of motion with the trains moving or you know force of motion is a huge one here at our zoo when we're talking about how animals are moving and the forces of water pressure. So there's all kinds of, of pieces that you can bring into that classroom. So it's building that capacity. So there is a lot of professional um, learning or development that happens between our partners with our teachers. Um, one example is, um, is uh, STEM with a, or excuse me, it was math with a, and that's the, all right, um, the um when we went to the architect firm is math with uh and we brought a team of teachers in to see all the math that was involved and you can do science with a so you can bring in those business partners to show them those connections and show the teachers um equip all educators with tools and structures to en to enable sustainable collaborations this is huge is you gotta you have to form these partnerships and these partnerships have to stay together they have to be sustainable even if a teacher retires or if a school administrator moves on it's you still have to form that partnership and i will talk a little bit more about zoo academy but it's been going on for 30 years now there's been a lot of retirements that have happened in that time but it's still chugging along and it's because of that that sustainable collaboration and that buy-in that comes in from the businesses and the education partners. Um, Lincoln in and out of school learning, I know um, that that's huge in our area is linking that in and out of school time. So with our classes or our summer day camps, or we have partnerships with the university to, to do joint summer um, camps for students or working in after school programs. What we can do is come in and really enhance what the kids are learning during the, the work or during the school day, but making it a little bit more engaging and spend a little more more time diving in deeper than what the classroom teacher is able to do. Um, creating learning progression that connects and deepens the experiences over time. Um, this has been very instrumental with our preschool. So we started with our early childhood. And so we start when you 
and I encourage all of you to come and visit our zoo and our programs because it's it's I can talk about it, but until you're down there with those kids and seeing what they're doing, you you really don't know what's happening. But um, but starting with those the little ones, the early childhood, um, developing those STEM skills, asking the questions, um, not being afraid to try something out moving right into that kindergarten. So kindergarten here is the kindergarten curriculum. They still have to take all the, the standardized tests or the test assessments, but it's with a zoo twist. So everything that they do is related to what's going on in the zoo. So for example, animal behavior, um, they're learning how to make observation in graphing. So just a simple ethogram in front of um, the penguin exhibit and marking wh which ones are, are swimming, which ones aren't, but they can ask that question in kindergarten. They can see this, they can, they can graph it together. And so they're, they're doing that STEM while they're learning how to count, while they're learning how to graph, while they're learning how to write the letter P for penguin. And they have sci science uh, notebook journals so they can write their observations down. Um, focusing instruction on experiential learning and real world con connect, uh, um, connections increases that relevance. So um, this is really important with forming um, partnerships in, I'm going to speak from the business aspect of it. I'm going to pretend like I'm a business that's never had students in there, really working with that business and say, hey, give us a challenge. What do you do on a daily basis that you still can't find an answer to? And we will have our students try to figure this out together. So the penguin nest box is an example. We need to engineer these boxes to help the population of African penguins, but it has to have certain parameters in order for uh, successful reproduction to happen. So how do we build this? So really working on that relevance. If it's relevant to them, they see that they're doing something and it's making an impact and that somebody from the business is there to listen or you report to them or you get feedback from them, it makes it more relevant to those students. Now, it's very rigorous too. It's very challenging, but it's also relevant. So the, the learning increases. Um, and then career opportunities and focus, really introducing the kids through all this to all the different career opportunities. Um, that are out there still to today when um, when I meet with our ecosystem, it's amazing all the different careers that are out there that I, I have never even heard of. And um, so these kids, introducing them, giving them those skills through those partnerships and relevant opportunities just gets them ready for whatever's down the road. Um, a successful STEM partnership, like I said, to be sustained for 30 plus years, it does look different in each community. There's a model that works wonderful here. I've worked with other states and we've taken the model and tweaked it so that it works within their states with different partnerships, especially when it comes to um, a museum or a zoo or aquarium, working with a university or working with the formal education realm, um, each one, there's this seems to be this framework, this basic framework, just like those basic ingredients that we had at the beginning, that if you put those pieces together, then that's when you're building those sustainable partnerships that last for a long amount of time, even if somebody leaves that organization or is that champion. So design around community and school district needs. This is huge. Really um, bringing in the partners from, from the city, you know, what, what is the city seeing? What are, what are the, the data or the stats in the, in the city? Bringing in the different business partners together and just really looking at, you know, what does that school district need? If the school district needs to increase um, science test scores, then how can we as a community jump in to help those classroom teachers to increase those test scores? So it's not, um, like I said, in isolation. Respect, trust, compromise, and collaboration. So this is a huge one. And 
just had a meeting last week and had to remind my business partners, um, our, being our school district <laughs> is our business partner with the zoo, but I have nine different school districts. So nine different sets of rules, nine different contracts that we have to deal with here at the zoo. And so really um, collaborating, compromising. And when the question is, Elizabeth, how come you can't increase the number of kids that are shadowing in with your primates? Well, that's a liability. So business-wise, I, I can't. First of all, they're under 18, which we really, our insurance has, you know, different um, specifications of how we can even have the kids in the primate area when they're not adults or old enough to do this. And so really collaborating and compromising and saying, okay, I can't put 20 of them in this animal area, but this is what we could do so that all the kids are having experience and rotate them through. So it's two at a time, which is more Hannibal. It's easier for the um, animal care staff to manage because they are seen as an intern. But what can we do with those 20 kids that they're still primate related that aren't shadowing in that animal area and getting so just that whole compromise and collaborating and reminding each other and the partners they remind me hey we have we have a uh you can't ask a kid to do a drug test without <laughs> if if they you know got injured on the job which we have to we, re we require that but yes we can do a drug test on a on a child who's on grounds and gets hurt, but there's just extra steps we have to go through to get them to be drug screened for liability. So that whole compromise and collaboration. The next one is the benefits for all partners. Your partners have to see that this is a real win-win for them and it needs to be a real win-win for you. So really pulling the pieces together and really identify, okay, what are the benefits? If I do this, with you in collaboration with you, what how is this going to benefit me? And so that's a question we're always asking. And um, the same vision, and that was at the beginning, the ingredients, you know, and um, you know, what is that vision? What are we all trying to do together so that we're meeting this? So um, it sounds simple. It looks simple. I'm rambling like, hey, this is nothing. <laughs> It takes work, guys. You know, I've been at uh, the Zoo Academy 30 years. And so I started as a classroom teacher. I was, um, when it was started out as a grant funded program where the zoo and the school district came together, the zoo was scared to death. They've never had anything like this. What's going on? You want us to do what? And so really working as a classroom teacher at that time to really break down those barriers and to really work and ease into this partnership where kids are on grounds and kids have a voice. They're sitting at the board table. They're part of construction planning. It, 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 took a, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of massaging and working with those partners and making sure everybody's on the same page and and understands um, what we can or we cannot do, but it comes back to that compromise and that that trust and respect. So what have we done? You see some pictures at the bottom. Um, and I tried to list some of the collaboration pieces and I didn't list them all because some of them are very long, but um, in the city of Omaha, there was a big need for preschools. And it was, the what had happened and that kind of goes back up to the community and district needs is we had an influx of little ones so there was like I believe at the time there was like 6,000 kids that didn't meet Head Start requirements and the school districts had Head Start programs so these kids were kind of in limbo and in they were in this gray I call them the gray area kids which is probably inappropriate but they were just, they really needed the services, but they, they didn't meet the requirements. And so um, in the collaboration with the city and with the school districts and the university, we all came together and it was like, come on, Elizabeth, you know, you've done this before. Let's try this out. I'm like, I can't do 6,000 kids, but we can do a preschool and it'll, it'll meet, you know, 
a hundred kids, which I know is a tiny portion, but it's moving in the right direction so that we can form a model that others could utilize. And so that's that's a prime example. So you'll see the university, we even brought in Council Bluffs, Iowa. So we went across the river to Iowa and then Omaha Public Schools. So there was a lot of meetings that came together um, to figure out how are we going to form this preschool at the zoo that benefits the zoo. It's it's mission driven. So we're building our next um, conservationists and STEM scientists in the world. So a lot of work. And then we had the preschool start and that started in, oh geez, 2005. So that's been going on and we still bring our partners in. We still look at this and it's ebb and flow over the years and change, but um, but it's moving, it's moving forward and it's opened up to a lot of kids in that area that really needed that extra effort. Um, then I, I don't have zoo kindergarten up here. There might be a picture later on, but zoo kindergarten, kind of same scenario. There was a need of um, finding an opportunity to engage e English language learners um, who weren't quite ready for kindergarten, but were kindergarten age, and we still needed to do kindergarten curriculum. And so we opened up our zoo kindergarten um, program. And so through looking at lit reviews and looking at research, utilizing animals, nature to help with the development of that language of languages or English language was implemented into this curriculum with the kindergarten at the time. And this was in 2001 when we formed this partnership with Omaha Public Schools. And so if you look at the kindergarten now, it's more from that original um, messaging, but our uh, need in the community, but it's grown and that partnership is still alive with having a, a full day kindergarten here in the zoo grounds. Um, middle school um, academy is another one that um, we were like, if we can do preschool and kindergarten and high school, why can't we do middle school? And the realization that was me as a partner going out to the school district saying, hey, let's just have a middle school here. And they're like, can't do that. It's, it's, so then we co compromise. I'm like, okay, what can we do? here at the zoo where we still are reaching middle schoolers, turn them on to, to STEM and getting them on that STEM track. And so we worked it out where middle school comes every other day for a two hour block and they take and their, their school, um, their schools are on block scheduling. So they're taking a zoology course and they're also taking an um, architect course, course. So they're using AutoCAD. So they're working with, um, not only the zoo experts here, but they're also working with our capital campaigns um, project. So new exhibit design. So they're working with some of these big organizations like Peter Kiewit and the archi architect firms like CLR and working jointly with them in designing some of our exhibits. And then of course, uh, Zoo Academy started out um, as me as a classroom teacher. And then when I came into my role here at the zoo, um, we added a school district, Papillion La Vista, and that was uh, really when I united two school districts, we really had to go back to, okay, what are our ingredients? Why are we here? What are the benefits? Okay, this is a zoo, zoo's first priority. It's our business. We will work with you. And so Zoo Academy formed with two school districts. And today, like I said, we have the nine school districts. We have three from over in Iowa. So even working out that magic of getting credits across the river when a Nebraska teacher's teaching has been um, a lot of a lot of work and challenges, but we we made it work. So Zoo Academy. So so identify your stakeholders. What are you trying to do? Find those community partners. You might start with somebody you know and they'll redirect you to somebody that that is the the key person but don't don't stop oh and you can see um the little kindergartners are planting trees down there so you can see our little kindergartners um oh this was a this is an activity so so you're developing so I, we don't have time for the activity but so you identify your stakeholders and then start thinking about what you think your stakeholders bring to the table when it comes to 
to um, the needs that you're trying to address or the curriculum you're trying to address. And then breaking down those barriers, you hear me talk about that. Um, when you're communicating, listen. Listen to what they're saying. Um, and we know this, this as leaders, we know to always listen, but really listen to what they're saying. And then hopefully they'll listen to what you're saying, but pulling those pieces together for them so that they can see how this partnership works, how this collaboration works between education and businesses. Um, learn the jargon. I had to learn this one the hard way. Um, and that was when um, I went directly from the classroom into my role here at the zoo. And, you know, we're in, we're a nonprofit organization, but there's a lot of business jargon that goes on here at the zoo. Just like other businesses, they have business jargon that happens compared to what's going on in education. And so learning that jargon, it took me a good six to eight months that my CEO and I were sitting at a table and we were saying the same exact thing, but we we're using different words. And then all of a sudden we both had an aha moment and like, oh my gosh, we're both saying the same thing, Elizabeth. And of course he's like, well, you need to use this term when you're talking to the business partners and I'll use this term when I'm talking to education. And, you know, as simple as when you say professional development or professional learning or training, training is, means something different to all different types of businesses. So just finding out and understanding and learning that jargon and then because you might be saying the word training, but you're thinking something totally different. Um, compromise, I'm, I said that 50 times already, that's huge. <laughs> um, build the relationship and trust, develop a plan. Start small, start small. Feel, feel, feel what's going on. If somebody um, comes to you or if you go to somebody else, start really simple. And it, you know, I, I'm not a fan of the one time, one and done, you come in and do a presentation, then you're out the door. You know, that's not based on my presentation. That is not what I'm about. But you might start small. It might start with the small little pieces or it might start small with, hey, let's write this lesson together or, hey, do you have an expert that can come and talk to me? Just But starting that small and then you can um, grow into these um, bigger partnerships and programs. Um, if you look at the bottom of this uh, of this page, I mean, you can see here we have a Zoo Academy student who was taken is we have a vet science course who's showing our vets and she's right there in a knockdown with a rhino for a physical. Now, you would not have seen that 15, 20 years ago because we were still building that relationship with the zoo and we are still building that trust. And we got to a point where these kids are right there front and center in the middle of surgeries and up and close and personal. Um, you can see the little kindergartners in the middle exploring um, fossils, I think is what they were exploring. So they were looking at some of the uh, history in Nebraska. And then on the far left, it's not a very good picture, but amphibian crisis and amphibian work. And so these, these students, I, I believe were middle school students. And so they were collecting data across Nebraska and fi filtering it into our team of scientists, conservation scientists. And so they are part of that research. They're part of that experience because they're out there collecting that data. And of course the researchers are then reporting back the findings with those kids. So you mix all the ingredients together and you get a whole array of partnerships that are forming. Um, you know, you can see we have a uh, uh, United Way as a partner on some of our programming. And when I say United Way, a lot of people will think uh, it's funding. They're giving you funds. No, this is a true partnership where we're, we, um, and this sounds bad. So don't quote me. I mean, this sounds really bad. And I know this recording is going to go out and everything. But yes, I do have to find funds. <laughs> but that's not the main reason we form these partnerships. We really are forming these partnerships to enhance the lives of these children and to um, push our mission forward with conservation and, and working. So really have a lot of 
bring in a lot of different people that can help us out and hit that that um, earmark. So Zoo Academy. First of all, should I wait and see if there's any questions before I show you what we did 30 years ago? No? Okay. You can ask all kinds of questions. So everything you just heard from me, I live and breathe on a daily basis and I truly believe in it because I've seen a lot of successes and I have seen some failures with forming these partnerships because we didn't mix the mix the pieces together. But Zoo Academy is one that was um, done right and it's still going strong and I see it, it's part of the zoo culture here and it's part of the school districts and it's part of our university here at, in the Omaha area. So the whole crazy idea of a zoo academy, and this was like, this is in the early 90s, so I'm really aging myself now, but there was um, a, star, uh, not star school, it was a uh, school to work or some some sort of federal grant that came out. And so my school district received the funding to form these different work career pathways within our high school. And so we pulled together uh, collaborative meetings where we had the zoo staff, because we had to get buy-in from our stakeholder, the zoo at the time. We brought in school administrators because they were key. If they, they weren't on board with what was happening, then this new concept of education wouldn't happen. We brought in the teachers, they were instrumental. The teachers had to have a voice because of their day-to-day. -day. Are we like brainstorming and coming up with these wonderful, great ideas that are unrealistic in the classroom? Brought in the Nebraska Department of Ed, the university, and then we brought in scientists on this too, on this whole concept of Zoo Academy. So we all came together, we all brainstormed, and we came up with a series of outcomes. And there's a lot of laughing. I still laugh at some of the outcomes we came up with that were just way out there, far-fetched, um, that never happened, which is okay because we laugh about them and we still joke about them. But we came up with a series of career paths. So just within the zoo itself, um, the Zoo Academy kids, we 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 have kids that are introduced to, to HVAC. Now, why in the zoo world would that be important? Well, that's important with the exhibits and the animal welfare and well-being of our animals is controlling those climates. We introduce them into graphic, so interpretive graphics. We introduce them into education. We introduce them into um, graphic designs, marketing. So we introduced them into all these different career pathways. And so, um, but also meeting the requirements of their, of um the state of Nebraska for the kids to receive credit. And so what we did was we pull in all of these relevant pieces together to form a series of courses. And so we've developed a whole series of um, courses and you heard vet science, but we also have international relations. Now, why would you have an international relations for your social studies teacher to teach? It's because we're on a daily basis um, working with U.S. Um, fish and wildlife, we're working on imports and exports of animals between countries and other organizations. Um, we were bringing in pandas at the time, or we were going to bring in pandas at the time. So it was, how do you shake the hand of the Chinese ambassador when they came and visited you in your class? Or So there was a lot of, of those relations that we had to talk about, and that's part of our daily business. So we unfold that into our social studies. Um, the opportunity for students to earn dual credit. So that's where our university partners came into play is, okay, these kids are taking some of these courses. Now, how can they earn dual credit? So um, you see this a lot with, there's a lot of health academies out there. So um, students will get EMT certifications through dual enrollment. Our kids will get elective science credits for dual enrollment. And one of the things, I have this up here, but one of our failures is our vet science aspect of, of the Zoo Academy. The kids were gonna um, get the first uh, semester or two semesters of being a vet tech, but the 
the university that we were partnered with lost their accreditation. So we, we decided to step back because we were afraid of our own personal accreditation being affiliated with a non-credited university. So we still are partners with that university. It's just in a different avenue or aspect. So that's another thing is, you know, sometimes you run into roadblocks, but how do you work around those? And then opportunity for the kids to work with professionals is huge. So the learning environment, um, the teachers are guiding the students through experiential learning, and um, they have a whole realm of professionals and resources to tap into. So for example, um, we have a behavior class. And so behavior class is meeting the psychology and the sociology credits um, that kids need to graduate, but it's bringing that use animal behavior aspect into it. So they're working with our animal behaviorists. And so the kids are going out and doing things with our animal behaviorists. And so the classroom teacher is guiding them through this, working through them, teaching them the, the theories behind operant conditioning or whatever it is, and, and bringing that back to the um, what they're learning in the classroom. So that relevance. And um, it's a non-traditional learning environment. It meets the needs of all the learners. There, there's some publications that I have out there based off of Zoo Academy where our learners, if you look at our students, the kids that are on verge of dropping out of high school or failing high school are the kids that are excelling in this program. And it's that relevant, that relevance, um, that rigor, that applying the knowledge that they're learning. So they're not just reading from a book, listening to a lecture or looking at films and memorizing. And what was interesting in the research too, is the kids that were, you know, 4 students or A students all their lives. Some of those kids did not do good in this program because they didn't know how to apply that knowledge. So it's really interesting. So when I work with our partners, uh, our school districts, a lot of times they want to um, bring the top of the of the class. You know, we do a whole interviewing process, and they want to bring the top top of the the class. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's look at the kids that are barely making it. I think there's they're the ones that we want. So experiential learning. I'm not going to read all this to you, but um, we had a spider STEM study that was going on with math, and so looking at spiders weaving a web and the different types of spider webs that are being weaved and looking at the math calculations. And it, so it was pretty cool. Um, Place-based, challenge-based learning, project-based, you see all that happening in these programs. And I'm running out of time, so I'm rushing through. Um, the structure is we have a team of teachers. So we have math, social studies, English, and science teachers. Um, the teachers, of course, don't come from one school district. They come from two school districts. So that's why I have to deal with contracts. Um, we identified we can take 120 um, at the, the, the numbers have changed with our school districts. I gave you the um, current numbers, but 120 students. And that was when that compromise of working, if we really truly want them to work one on one, like you see in this picture with the Stingray, then I can't have a thousand kids here or 500 kids here. I need to, what, what is, what is our liability and how do we do this? And then um, block scheduling, half day. So a student can be here a full day or they can be here a half day. Majority of the kids spend a half day here. So we had to work through all this in collaboration in a lot of talking back and forth. So this is all great and, and fun and Danny and Elizabeth says, you know, you should form partnerships and collaborations, but you have to look at that benefit. So at the beginning or in one of the slides, I said, look at the benefit. How is this benefiting you? We're de developing our workforce. Um, new projects with fresh ideas. Our whole adventure trails that we opened up, our children's adventure trail, it was all designed by kids. I brought in all kinds of kids and asked them, what do you want to do? And they were drawing out stuff. So if you look at that, that there's a whole incredible ideas that come out of there. Um, projects, um, new ideas and projects. We had um, two plover turns that SS, our, our species survival plan had asked us to mate and they were supposed to mate and we we're supposed to have offspring, but they were not mating. So the kids did a study of the exhibit 
came up with some ideas how to change the exhibit and then we were successful at breeding so those fresh ideas and now these are kids so I mean we bring in our preschool and our kindergartners to give us advice and give us direction or design all the way up to the the adult the high school kids um, we're impacting the PhDs and DMVs right now Omaha has a an abundance of vets and their majority of them are former zoo academy students so that's exciting our um, zoo we have over 30 employees full-time employees that are zoo academy one being one of my managers um, here in the education department she went into that education realm and so just uh, and then um, working with your partner so uh, just coming up with just innovative new ways of teaching and learning and developing those pedagogies. That's been a, a huge benefit for the zoo of being that leader in that innovation and learning strategies. And then um, it's opened up the door to a lot more um, community partners. So, so for example, our symphony, our Omaha symphony has partnered up with us. And you're like, what, how does that work out? Well, hello, how do animals communicate? Through sound, sound waves what happens with an instrument. So then you can start pulling in these different pieces. And so the symphony will come and do a whole um, program with the instruments that are, are trying to replicate the sound of, of animals. And in return, the students are trying to create new devices to communicate with the animals. So it's, it's, there's a, it's, it's unlimited, the number of things that you can do with your partners. And school districts, university partners prepare students in the workforce um, more rigor and relevance and more contributions to the community and so the vet tech right there the blonde she um, is a former zoo academy student she's been here at the zoo for 27 years to be a vet tech it's a two-year program so she went to community college so she's been on staff for a long time through the program so questions now this is for real questions <laughs> i'm open <laughs> hello i'm maria wallace i'm a assistant professor in the center for stem education at usm and i'm really enjoying your presentation because <laughs> i've been fortunate enough to work with the hattiesburg zoo locally um with uh, my partner who's actually on the call too, Jeremy Compton um, over there. And so I'm just very inspired by a lot of the things that you're sharing. And I was wondering, it seems like a lot of the Zoo Academy has been more focused on the youth, kind of more like uh, as the central focus of the, the impact you could say, I guess. One of the things that Jeremy and I have been thinking a, a lot about, and I'd be curious to hear your perspective is on um, the impact on like the informal educators professional growth and or also the k-12 teachers learning mm -hmm. yeah so um so there's a lot of components that you know that i didn't dive into but that professional learning piece with the classroom teachers um we provide a lot of professional learning or teacher workshops with our teachers to really um work through the curriculum and show them or try to show them some of the different connections between the zoo and what they're learning in the classroom. Um, some of the some of our teachers get continuing ed credit with this. I think this is the direction you're going in. But then our university, we do have an and I, it wasn't on there and don't laugh when you hear this, but I'm an adjunct for the University of Nebraska Omaha. And so I have a whole course on how to to um build informal science educators, but also formal ed and letting them to decide on what career path that they wanna go in. But I will tell you um, informal science education um, is an area that I think all of us across the country really need to unite and not necessarily get a certificate or can't hire somebody unless they have a certificate, but trying to, mm -hmm. to, to show that pathway within the education departments at the university. And I know there's quite a few that are starting to go in that direction. Um, internships are huge here. So we do have 
quite a few um, internships here, and that falls in my department too. And so we've taken the Zoo Academy concept with our internships, and our interns have to do a project that benefits the zoo, but also benefits them, and it's based on what their interests are. And so we've had quite a few um, individuals that became an animal area intern, but really developed an education component um, for our that's benefited our department. Did I answer? I think I answered. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question that uh, a couple of students sent questions. Um, okay because they had to leave early. Uh, one is, do you have any tips to increase long-term sustainability to informal programs? She said she's thinking of the Frog Watch program from Akron oh. Zoo. Yep. Um, so, um, so our amphibian crisis, that, um, oh man, I'm really dating my, that was like in the early 2000s when, the chytrid fungus, you know, issue and AZA was really worried about that. And then um, Akron Zoo took over Frog Watch, which has kind of formed that partnership. And we, so we have um, school districts across the, across the state who are, have actively put this into their curriculum. We've shown them how to do it. It meets the standards. And so they're out collecting the data and they're part of Frog Watch too. So, so we've learned that utilizing our classroom teachers and really educating them, that's really keeping, keeping that momentum going. And so we've seen an increase in our um, public engagement, some of our outreaches where we've done Frog Watch activities. And we've seen a lot of these kids bringing their parents, and then they become active um, citizen science um, with, with Frog Watch and, and start running off on their own. Um, it's, it's really, I think it ebbs and flows, but once you start getting that engagement, then you have a following. And once it gets into the curriculum or once a teacher gets it into the classroom, it keeps with them until their career ends or they pass it on to the next person for that sustainability. But we've seen school districts that are been with us for a long time. And then another one um, is from a, a middle school teacher. So she's uh, teaching right now, um, but she was wanting, she's, because you have the middle school academy, are there projects that you can recommend for groups of middle schoolers doing life science projects that mm -hmm. alongside the zoo, not just. There's the a, there's a the yeah, there's a lot of them. So whoever our zoo partner is online right now, get ready, let <laughs> get to come in. But, but there's a lot of different opportunities. And um, so, uh, and we encourage, we encourage, we have a huge, uh, re not huge, we're talking three scientists, but a very um, well-known research department. And so they will give advice. They will they will talk with the kids, encourage the kids, but our curators also get involved. So what how we've done this is we'll we'll go out and ask that the supervisor of the different buildings and the curators, like, what project do you need done? behavior projects, observation, what do you need done that you don't have time to do? And then they work jointly with that classroom teacher and those students to come up with the data sheet. Um, and then they go out and then they collect the data. So then they can come up with their, their own, um, you know, hypothesis, they have their data, they can come up with their own uh, conclusion or results, but they're turning this over. So then they can present it to our people, but also then our people have that data and they can look at and, and, and sift through it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do on zoo grounds. Um, I don't know if, uh, if the school of the zoo in your area builds enrichment items, but that's engineering. Have them start thinking about how to, to build a, uh, a feeder 
some sort of a feeder out of PVC piping or whatever um, that could go into an exhibit, but of course with the expert given direction and then have the kids follow through and do observation. Are they utilizing it? When are they utilizing it? Um, so that they can go that full circle with their with their engineering. So there's a lot. The the biggest thing is it's okay to say no to a student, to a child, you know, if they're presenting, say, oh, you know, encourage, thank you, thank you, thank you. But we'll select our piece that we're gonna move forward with, or if this might, okay, well, let's go back to the drawing board and start all over again. So and that's part of the process, a learning process. And so that's the one thing with the staff here is, okay, open up your doors, let it happen. Don't have to take it off, but, see what happens because it's amazing what the the power of the of the youth are and what they can do and the ideas that they come up with so. well if you i have i have my new email address on this on it was on my last slide it, you can see it in the video so if you have other questions and stuff i can help direct that but um help you out, but I don't know if there's anything else. Um, I had a question. Uh -huh. um, so my question is, I, I loved the talk, by the way. Um, I work with Dr. Wallace as well. Uh, she's my advisor. So uh -huh. very much involved in the zoo partnership. Um, I was wondering, how do you vet the business partners that you choose to make sure that they're going to be like investing back into the community and the STEM ecosystem? And how do you kind of maintain those checks and balances? Yeah. So that that's a really good question um, because you everybody goes in really positive and and I will I will say I, I'm gonna put my when I was a classroom teacher hat on and I would go to a business and they were open doors arms and then you start talking with them and a lot of times if a business partner says yeah I'll just send a speaker then you're like okay then you take it to the next step well what else do you have what else besides just a speaker I mean what what are you working on what are some of and if they can't follow through or if they can't answer that question then yes you know bow nicely and politely sure come and be a guest guest speaker Try it once or twice more. And if you're still getting that, and there's nothing wrong with guest speakers, but if you're still getting that guest speaker, you're not getting that investment, then you know it's time to move on to another partner or find somebody else in that organization. So, and believe me, we've we've been through so many different partners, um, you know, and, and we've listed a lot of partners, but they kind of ebb and flow. And I just had a conversation with our CEO about, um, some of our partners and I'm like well this one sounds like they're starting to come back <laughs> to service again just to prepare you know for the future um, but you know we'll see what happens this time around but being uh, keep everybody really close to you and friends with you and because all of a sudden if they see somebody else doing it then I'll, they might change their investment thank you yeah. And I'm, I'm going to add to that. And that what I just said, when they see somebody else, we've that's where we've seen this ripple effect happening, especially with and I keep bringing up the architects because they were hard nut to crack. But once once one saw that what what um, one of the architect firms was doing, then the next one wanted to do it better. And so then then they then they all decided they should come together. So but it you just have to kind of try to break down that door, but it's okay to, to bow out nicely. I have another question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm really glad Caroline asked that question. I, you've mentioned also uh, like just research engagement and it sounds like from what you've shared so far, mostly we're, you've been talking about research from the angle of like, um, kind of the species development sort of side of things, but I'm wondering what role do you see, I guess, educational research playing in these kinds of partnerships too, or what examples of that have already been going on in your experience? So, so yeah, 
that's another nut to crack <laughs> because I don't know if your school districts are like the state of Nebraska. <laughs> they really, we have a hard time getting into the districts to do research, but, um, but that's one of the beautiful things about Zoo Academy is that partnership is, yeah, we have all the school districts, but part of our agreement that we have is it opens up the door to research. So we can look at the different um, teaching styles. Even when we were in COVID and we were online, not all of our school, believe it or not, but our school districts were still in session. We had some that weren't. So then we had this hybrid teaching that was going on. And so we had a, quite a few of our university partners coming in and observing, now, how is this working? How cool is this? Is There might be one kid in person, but there's three computer or three Zoom screens and they're still working on a project together. Um, so yeah, um, we also, um, we, you know, we strive, we try to do a lot of research on what we're doing on the, how kids learn or the learning aspects of it. And so our Adventure Trails has had um, several publications on, on learning through play, learning through nature, I think she, I think Ann Carabon even identified a new type of risk play, a new level of risk play. So, so we're really open to that, but um, our after school, but that's where the business partner at the business has these different components and makes it a little bit easier in our area. If I was to go, um, there's some things that come through that I do go through the school district so that they can do their approval of the research that's going on with the kids. But for me to go into the school, even for my own personal research, um, you know, it's it's really an act <laughs> to, around here it is to get in to do that. Um, but um, but turning it to practice, I think that's important is is the research that we have been doing, we have that practice to show it and, and we demonstrate and model it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so Dr. Wallace, I was also gonna say um, student teaching, put student teachers into informal environments. And I know you have a like, kind of program that you're doing, but we the programs I've been mentioning, we have student teachers. I've been thinking about this because we have, we, we were able to actually have a teacher internship program last year that um, we're getting paid to do additional like field work experience at the zoo uh -huh. as an educational docent. But one of the, tr the like linchpins that we've run up against kind of is like the formal K-12 teacher licensure world usually only see school spaces as legitimate yeah. um, sites of preparation. So I guess maybe could you talk about what would a student teaching experience at a zoo? like? And, how to yeah, and we just, so there's been two battles I've been trying to battle during my career here. Um, one, I haven't been successful yet, but hopefully, hopefully someone will run through, but that's that whole certification piece of it because the majority of my staff were certified teachers but they lose that certification because they're not in a formal ed. And so I've been working at the state level on that piece of it um, because we're all educators, we're all teaching. It just looks different. Um, but the student teaching part, I finally, the last three years broke down the, the walls with the University of Nebraska, Omaha and um, um, College of St. Mary's with their teacher program. And so we have um, student teachers that are coming in for like our zoo academy science and then kindergarten. We have student teachers that are coming in for kindergarten. So the way we've set it up is they come in and they um, do their practicum experience in those area, but but then they also go up to the to one of the formal ed schools so they can see the other side of it. And so that's worked out nice and it's worked out nice with our career too, is to show there's there's um you can be a formal ed teacher, but there's these non-traditional areas, but. Okay. So yeah, so we we were just playing with the number of hours. Yeah, and yeah. I think, honestly, I think they, um, because our state has so many requirement uh, required hours too, but they added on to it for the requirement. Okay. 
Thank you. That's helpful. It's got my, you know, I, it, we think about like, we have student teachers who will go study abroad, like teach abroad. And mm -hmm. these are similar questions kind of that might come up, but in the context of that, that international mm -hmm. school experience, yeah. but maybe it's kind of a similar reflection point for getting people into informal spaces for student yeah. teaching too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I am open. I, like I said, I have my new email address. I, I am transitioning from the zoo world into a new science education world. And that starts on November 1st. So my zoo email is active until the October 30th. And then, um, but I'm always, I'm always around. I've lived this, breathed this for 30 years. So I can, I can help give guidance. So. There is, there, I know we're over time. There was one question in the chat. I don't know if you can answer it real quickly. Oh, sorry. Let me How look. do students and others who are not directly involved in decision-making processes advocate for these kind of programs? Oh, that's another, that's another good one because, um, you know, really, I always encourage my, my students, um, especially my master's students, go to that administration and really say, hey, look at this, or hey, let me try this in my classroom and really advocate for that piece of it. Um, uh, looking at the, the research that's been done on these different programs, because they're all over the country, there's different models, there's different looks all over. Um, but that 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 is the good old I know I'm going around and around, but um, that's the good old question is how do you how do you make these changes and they stay within a school district or a school system that's been around for what hundreds of years? Um, so that's a good one. But just keep pointed out, keep saying, keep showing, demonstrate in your classroom, demonstrate with your students, show them how, show people how doing these different projects in your class or partnerships and how it's really engaging those kids. That's all you can do is keep showing. Okay. Right. Well, you've given us so much information yeah. and so opened like what pathways to go to and things that exist that we just didn't know how to grab hold of. Um, so I think uh, a lot of us who do the informal, informal STEM education have a lot more in our toolbox. Yeah. Well, go ahead. So, thanks for the information you've, you've presented. So thank you so much. No, oh, thank you for having me. And please, please, please reach out because I'm very passionate about this. So, all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so uh -huh. much. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye. -bye. Bye.